Um, so good morning, um, everyone. Um, um, I am uh, Linda Stewart, I'm the co-chair of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Committee on Assessing and Navigating Biosecurity Concerns and the Benefits of Artificial Intelligence Used in the Life Sciences. Along with my co-chair, Mike Imperiali, um, I'd like to welcome you to our first in-person information gathering meeting and seventh committee meeting. Um, the task being undertaken by this committee is to understand the convergence of artificial intelligence and life sciences, an emerging area of research and development with the promising benefits and um, applications, but also security implications. This committee will consider the ways in which AI enable biological design tools and biological data sets for training AI can increase and mitigate biosecurity risks, specifically on concerns of transmissible biological threats that could pose significant epidemic and pandemic scale consequences. You can find the full statement of tasks for this study, as well as the list of members of the study committee at the web, website of the National Academies Um before we get started, I'd like to share a few notes about today's meeting. This is an open session and is open to the public and on the record and is being recorded. This is an information gathering session. That is, the committee is in the process of assembling information that will be, will examine and discuss the, in the course of making its findings, conclusions and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in this, these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft is written, it must go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee must then respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's report, right, re report review committee and the NAS uh, president before it's considered an official Academy's report. This morning's speaker will be discussing a range of topics related to the convergence um, of AI and biology. Uh, our first speaker is Arturo Casadevall, Professor and Chair of Microbiology and Immunology at Johns Hopkins University. His research is focused on fungal and bacterial pathogenesis, and he is a globally known expert in humoral immunity, molecular biology, virulence, and cryptococcus. His work has been recognized with numerous awards and he's been elected to the National Academy of Science and Medicine. So over to you, Artur. I think we were hoping for uh, an introduction, um, 10 minutes and then some time. 10 minutes. I, uh, before the computer crashed, I practiced. I think I had it down to eight. So okay. <laughs> here I go. Uh, this is the title you gave me uh, in the program. And I can't. My understanding of the title is how can AI be used for good and bad in microbial pathogenesis in 10 minutes? So I think one of the things important to wrap around is how many pathogenic microbes are there? Uh, they come in five classes, bacteria, fungi, worms, protozoa, and viruses. And people have tried to add them up. And even though the numbers have been all over the place, I think it's safe that we know between I mean, it's about between 1,500 and 2,000. That is a fraction of the total microbial species out there. It's to be a pathogen is hard. It's, uh, and there are few and far between. However, one thing I want you to know is that the major things that we worry about are recent. Influenza, smallpox, measles, and now HIV has happened during historical times. So it's entirely possible, and we live through SARS-CoV-2, that we're going to see a lot more stuff that is new and quite deadly. Uh, can AI alert us about new threats? Yes, that would be a good thing. Can AI enhance existing threats? Yes, it's a bad thing. And can AI enhance and defeat defenses? It's both a good and a bad thing. So first, I want you to consider the three microbial requirements for virulence. It, the fixed ones are it needs to be able to grow at 37 degrees, uh, and it resistant to mild alkalinity. That is, our body fluids are around 7.4. 
then comes a whole set of what people call virulence factors. These are variable, they're all over the place, range from capsules to proteases, to enzymes, toxins, and most importantly, all, you need a susceptible host. This is a key concept. No microbe is a pathogen unless it has a susceptible host. Pathogen is not an independent uh, microbial property. An important point is, you asked me to talk about transmissibility, but transmissibility is not a requirement for virulence. It is an amplifier of the outcome. For example, anthrax is not transmissible, despite its attack potential. Uh, AI can identify choke points that can, can if modified, can meet new pathogens. For example, find where the choke points are for thermal tolerance and change them. It could identify new virulence factors that will function in mammals. It could, AI could identify new vulnerabilities that can be exploited in enhancing pathogens or designing new vaccines or drugs. So to, to understand how I see things, I got to take you back 20 years when we proposed the damage response framework. And it comes out of this deductive reasoning from a single sentence. Virulence is a microbial property that is expressed only in a susceptible host. If you accept that, then virulence is a function of host immunity. If you accept that, then virulence is the relative capacity of a microbe to cause damage in a host. We understand that some of them are more virulent than others. What makes them different is the more virulence give you more damage. And then comes the big insight that damage is a function of host immunity. So damage occurs in situations of weak immune responses or very strong immune responses and can come from the host and the microbe. So I set out to quanti try to quantitate this a few years ago. And in, in airplanes, waiting for air to board and things develop what was called the pathogenic potential of a microbe. I wanted a simple formula that could be used to, to quantitate things. The pathogenic potential is the fraction symptomatic multiplied by the inoculum, multiplied by an amplifier term that is 10 to the mortality, the fraction mortality. So if your pathogen only makes you lose weight, it doesn't kill you, M becomes zero, and that term becomes one. It's an amplifier term. And this has been developed over several papers over the years. But here is what happens. If you go to the literature and you find the mouse data, and AI could do this for you very rapidly today, you can see that all these microbes on the right are pathogenic for mice, but that there is no break line. There is no place in which you can say something is a pathogen or a non-pathogen. All microbes have some pathogenic potential. You can always kill a host with a big enough inoculum. If you change the host, the pathogenic potential changes. Uh, these are organisms, viruses, a bacterium, a fungus, and in which you just basically change the, the mouse strain. And the difference in pathogenic potential can be as much as 10,000 fold for Sendai virus or, or as little as 100 fold for Listeria. So in the early years of the 20, 21st century, I became very interested in the weapon potential of a microbe. And the, basically, the weapon potential has to depend in somehow in the pathogenic potential, in, in, the, in, in basic microbial parameters. But it, it can be amplified by the technological capacity of the aggressor. Can you make sports? And then there is human nature, panic, whatever. Can you open up an envelope and empty a building? So I worry about only the biological parts. So you're basically left with virulence which is a function of virulence, the basic microbials and amplification factors, the weapon potential. You really want something, great damage in a short period of time. And this was the formula paper that we wrote. And this is why I was put in the NSABB. This caused a big consternation at the time. Uh, and it was published in 2004, the NSABB took off in 2005. But what you can see is that in fact, the pathogenic potential is incorporated into the formula. Very simple formula, I show you how to use it. The fraction symptomatic of the inoculum, the, the, no, the numerator is multiplied by transmissibility or communicability and instability divided by time. So let's do that for anthrax. Uh, for um, what is the, you know, before we do, what is the maximum weapon potential? You can let's say a set communicability 100%. Every, every it spreads all the time, completely stable. It kills you in a day. The fraction symptomatic is 100%. The inoculum is one spore. So the maximum you can be is, is 100. Just, uh, uh -oh. no, no, I'm sorry. I'm pause. It's very dramatic. <laughs> this video looks frozen. 
my own sorrow. Arturo, Arturo, you look frozen if you could hear us. We are not frozen to each other, right? <laughs> no, I can hear you still. Oh, let's try to get in. Oh, I just dropped off. You're mute, out here. I'm back. I don't know what happened there. I heard some voices and he went out. You froze right after you told us the maximum potential. Okay, so why don't we go? Let's just rapidly. Sorry about this. <laughs> It didn't happen on my end, guys. Can you see this? Not yet. Okay, so the maximum potential is here, 100. Do it for anthrax. You can see, I'm just going to go through it. It's 5.6 and 10 to the minus 4. That means there is a tremendous... Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. We, we still have not got your slides back. You still can't get my slides back. All right, let's... We Maybe the problem is... Do you get them back now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm almost at the uh, end. I don't know why I can't. Oh, I got it. So, okay, for bacillus and traces, 5.6 and 10 to the minus 4. The maximum is 100. You have a lot of room to grow and make things uh, larger. If you now do it for, for things like variola, bacillus and traces, HIV, and candida albicans, candida is very weak, but HIV is very interesting. If you want to take out a society over a period of 10 years, it's got a, a greater pathogenic potential than bacillus and traces because time, if you take time, the element out. It turns out that eventually the, the national security apparatus in this country realized that, and, and before we had widespread antiretroviral drugs, they recognized that something like HIV that can weaken you over 10 years is supposed to be tremendous. Uh, national security implications. A couple more slides to go. Uh, you asked me to say something about the fungi. I've been warning about this for about 20 years. Uh, not a lot of success. Wrote this paper on pathogenic, human pathogenic, where the calculation for coccidioidis images gives you a greater weapon potential than for bacillus and traces. Um, but you know, the humans are humans and they worry about what they know. But Hollywood did a great job for the fungi by making that series The Last of Us. And we had, uh, I had my 15 minutes of fame uh, talking about, could this happen? The answer is yes, but unlikely. Uh, by the way, I've written a book recently, What If Fungi I Win, where a lot of these ideas are developed. So I wanna end with three things I learned in medical school. Retroviruses don't cause disease, but they are useful for studying how viruses might cause disease. Two years later, Gallo reports that HDLV1 causes lymphoma, and three years later, HIV is, is, is the cause of AIDS. I'm told in medical school, coronavirus are a nuisance. They only cause sniffles. 20 years later, we have the outbreak of SARS-1, and now we have had a pandemic. I'm being told fungi are major pathogens that are not contagious. Today, fungal disease are a major problem. In 2022, the WHO finally reacted and or organized the critical pathogens and things. The white nose syndrome is devastating in mouse populations. And we've seen the catastrophic amphibian decline. So everything you know today in microbial pathogenesis can change. And that is where AI comes in. AI allows you, what we do when we try to prepare is we look under the lamppost. Humans are not very good at saying, at looking at future threats. We're not very good at preparing, but AI could help us. AI could help us tremendously to, to, to go through the mass of literature in the, in the, in the, to, and sort out what can be there. I'm telling you that I'm studying for the boards again. I have to recertify every 10 years in infectious disease. And it's often, you can get all this set of questions, it's often how you frame the question. But AI is magnificent. AI will go right through the literature and identify things for you. So it's got tremendous potential for good and bad. And I think I did it in 10 minutes. Thank so you so much. Um, stop sharing.
Thank you so much, Arthur. That was great. And um, that was like a perfect uh, uh, preamble to, I'm sure, questions from the group. Um, I'll open it up. To and by the way, I'll send you the slides uh, uh, after this so you can have them. Okay. I'll open it up to folks. Um, Heidi? Yes, hi. Thank you so much, Arturo. That was great. Uh, I've been mentioning uh, fungi for a while now. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, I think they're underestimated. I think they're already doing a lot um, in some ways. We're just not realizing it for like low grade uh, uh, chronic health issues. Uh, I don't have the data for that yet, but let's see. So my question to you then is, uh, and sorry if I missed it, is you said that it's possible for, for fungi to be... Uh, Problem, but it's unlikely. Can you just walk us through the unlikely? No, I, I think what I said was I was talking about oh, no. that the the all of us the, that that show that was okay. very popular here in the United States in which a fungus a cordyceps turns people into zombies. Yes. No, okay. That's fine. But I mean, in general. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, but I mean, in general, would you say that like would you have a scenario like would you have a scenario where there is yes. a high? So, yes. So I, I can say it to you what it is. Yeah. Uh, the fungal world has 6 million species. They are the major pathogens of plants, insects. The, the only thing protecting us is temperature for most of them. Uh, they cannot grow at 37 degrees, but the world is getting warmer, and we're already seeing the emergence of candida auris. So imagine that you have a fungal species, one of these, that just has to sporulate in the lung. So when you sporulate in the lung and you cough, you cough out the spores. So now you have lethal infection that is contagious. And you're in a place that humanity has never been before. Just like it wasn't <laughs> with the retroviruses and things like that. that. That is the problem. The problem is I can imagine all these things, but it is very hard for people to get activated in the, in the, without having a historical example. Perfect. Thank you so much for that example. But, so if we're going <clears> to <throat> so use the equation, let's say, as a driving factor for artificial intelligence to search for new combinations or new particular species that might fit the bill in ways that we haven't considered before. Um, is the data there for feeding into some type of a machine learning framework to do the search? So I believe it is. Uh, I can tell you that me, my and some collaborators have began this work and by looking at, at fungal collections. So what we've been looking at a fungal collection is something simple. Does it have pathogenic potential for another species like plants, insects, uh, worms? Uh, and then what is closest to 37 degrees? Because most of these things can only grow up to 30, 31, 32. And then you could say, well, if you're, if you're able to grow at 35 degrees, you have two degrees protecting you. That is not hard to breach. And then that organism is coming loaded with everything. It's coming loaded with the ability to take down innate immunity. And then you have a problem. So I believe the data is there. The data is very incomplete. But the time to have begun this would have been years ago. So Mike and then Titus. Okay, this is Mike. Um, thanks very much. So how easy or hard is it to say, take a non a, a fungus that's not pathogenic today and engineer it to become pathogenic? And then on top of that, do you, do you see AI greatly facilitating that ability or not? So let, let, uh, do, you, do you guys know about Candida auris in this audience? So Candida auris was not a, not a, a known pathogen. It emerges simultaneously in three countries in in 2011. This came out of nowhere, and since then we have had two more emergencies. When the organism first emerged, it was not very thermotolerant. And in fact, the isolates required from the environment are often not that thermotolerant, but it's rapidly acquired the capacity for heat, such that today most isolates grow off 42 degrees. It's completely defeated or, or thermal barrier. Fungi can be very rapidly adapted to grow at 37 degrees by training them in an incubator. What you do is you start with 30, you put them at 30.5, let it sit there for a couple of weeks, take out what grows, go to 31. This has been done 
And in six months, you can take an organism from 30 to 37 degrees. So you don't really need AI. You don't need AI, but AI could help you by identifying the best candidate so you don't spend your time on it. Thanks. Um, Titus? Yeah, I appreciate your your input. Um, I, you know, there's no argument that there's scary bio threats. The question we're really trying to suss out is what is the delta risk associated with AI or or benefit of using AI in these kind of scenarios? So if we can, if people can do what you just described with an incubator, then to me, it sounds like AI is is neither here nor there in that context, but is there a way to use these tools to help respond or prevent those kinds of? So I would say issues? this this is how it would help. We know a bit about thermal tolerance. We know the genes that that have been changed when you acquire that. AI could rapidly sort through the genomic literature. AI could tell you this is a better candidate than that candidate, uh, because it may be that if you start doing this you know, empirically, you may run into some of them where you hit a maximum of 30, 34 and you can't, that's a, that's your ceiling. So it may, so AI could do that. AI could also tell you which ones got the pathways that are drug resistant so that your existing drugs won't work. I'm talking about nefarious uses of, of, uh, of this technology. Uh, so, yeah, so I see AI as a very a great amplifier on reducing time. Okay, great. But, Thank you. It, but if you want new things, AI could potentially look, let's say that you're focused on humans. AI could help you look at, at the entire literature on the fun, on the insects and could say, are there some commonalities in in, in defeating insect immunity? We know that insects have innate immunity and we have innate immunity. So that may give you again, a hint on how you could use things. So the getting to the, to the earlier question, my view is the more we learn, the more powerful AI becomes. Uh, yeah, more, more question of, you know, when I think about uh, fungal pathogenesis, I think about, um, uh, plant diseases, uh, you know, I was wondering if you've kind of looked at that in the context of, you know, chance of spillover coming from agricultural um, uh, fungi into into animal populations, because like that would be a, a, a kind of well-studied uh, kind of set of fungal pathogens. So the answer is yes. Uh, there are several fungi that are trans-kingdom pathogens. For example, Fusarium yeah. is a pathogen of plants. It can cause human disease that is practically untreatable. Uh, but we also have the, a new example in the Netherlands where in order to save the tulips, farmers spread azoles. When you put the azoles on the soil, you, sell, you select for resistant to all the fungi. And then the aspergillus in the soil shows up in the hospital with resistant to azoles. So yeah, there are examples there. And I... Uh, Certainly, there are several trans kingdom examples. They will, Fusarium will be an excellent example. It can take out plants, it can take out people. So, I have a question just around um, the level of kind of expertise um, that you think would be required. So, do you think um, AI can enable different players or different actors to be? manipulate fungi or do you still need a, a level of technical expertise that I, I think you always need a level of technical expertise and I wouldn't like to know where it's settled I think you need some basic education you need to be able to write you need to be able to answer a question you need to be able to buy an incubator but for example you could ask AI can you give me examples where fungi have been trained to higher temperatures and in um, in a couple of seconds or so they will basically produce several papers and then you could read those papers and you could see how you could train a fungus to go to a higher temperature. Whereas imagine doing that, you know, a decade ago, uh, many of those papers are not even in databases. Uh, some, they, they are obscure literature, things like that. It, may, it would just take much longer. Okay. We have, I think, one more minute of our tour. 
Any questions that people have? This is the you? best part of my day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you my last minute for anything you want to talk about. But um, anything yeah, I would just say, want... take this seriously. Well, Hi, Heidi. Yeah, hi again. So what would you, what are you worried about with AI though? What's your, like, what's your top two, top three worries? My worry with AI is that, you, is the engineering of something that humanity is not prepared for. Simple as that. Humans are simply not good at planning for the future. And their experience is based on the past. And even when they know what they're doing, they don't do it very well. Look at the Look what happened with the pandemic. So my worry is that somebody will put two and two together and AI will allow them to do things very rapidly. I mean, in fact, give them hints of things they weren't even thinking about. Okay. And then at this stage though, I mean, given that experts, well, I, I guess we could say experts are not doing it for malicious <laughs> purposes. So maybe that's why we haven't seen it. But would you say that, would you say that that if experts aren't able to do something similar, even when they're doing it for good reasons, you know, they're not doing it to, to create anything uh, malicious, would you say that we're far off or some like- I, You know, have... AI, AI is being used already. It's being used in the laboratory. We use it in our lab. Uh, it and is- How much does it help you? Well, it, it, it helps us, for example, uh, in designing an, an agar, you could ask the AI, mm -hmm. Um, I want to, what would be a good agar for growing this? And instead of me spending hours trying to sort it out, you could, it gives you a hint immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, we often ask, uh, you can ask AI, I want to do an experiment. Can you give me some controls? It lists you a lot of controls. Most of them are nonsense, but occasionally one tells you, you haven't thought about it. And that saves you a lot of time and makes your science better. Mm -hmm. AI is wonderful. And I think it's going to help humanity far more that is going to hurt it, even though most of the discussion is being based on the negative. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Arturo. If you'd like to, um, we really enjoyed that one. Appreciate your your contribution. I hope it's okay if we come back to you with any questions. Oh, uh, you know, Mike tells me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there. I'll send you the slides. Okay. Right, thank folks. you. Very much. Have a good day. Bye bye. Yeah, we'll return at 10.30, everybody who's online. So um, I want to welcome back to the in-person information gathering meeting for the Committee on Assessing and Navigating Biosecurity Concerns and the Benefits of Artificial Intelligence Use in the Life Sciences. As a reminder, the task being undertaken by the Committee is to understand the convergence of artificial intelligence and the life sciences. and emerging area of research and development with promising benefits and applications, but also security implications. We've, you can find the full statement of tasks for this study, as well as the list of members of the study committee at the website nationalacademies.org. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few notes about today's meeting. This open session is open to the public and on the record and is being recorded. This is an information gathering session that is, the committee is in the process of assembling information that, is, that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has, not, has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, shall not be interpreted as positions of the committee or the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing the draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee then must respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the National Academy of Sciences President before it can be considered an official Academy's report. I would now like to introduce this session's speakers. Jason McClellan uh, is a professor of molecular sciences and the Welsh Chair of Chemistry at the University of Texas in Austin. 
He researches viral and bacterial proteins and his work to understand how these proteins are structured and how they function has factored into the development of um, uh, vaccines. As an inventor of a method for engineering key proteins in coronaviruses and respiratory viruses for use in vaccines, Lefellin has been key in the development of the technology found in many leading vaccines against COVID-19 and the respiratory syncytial virus RSV. Emanuele Adriano is currently a project leader in the monoclonal antibody discovery laboratory at Fondazione Toscana Life Sciences, directed by his mentor, Professor Rino Pui. His work tackles different pathogens that pose serious threats to global health, such as RSV, antimicrobial resistant Neisseria gonorrhea, SARS CoV 2, and more recently, monkey. So with that, I'll hand over to the two of you to uh, give a short presentation and then I'll open it up for questions. Thanks both of you for joining. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So I think uh, Manuel will start uh, and then I'll, I'll take over from there. And we kind of have it broken up into two parts. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pause after the first part uh, and uh, then we'll see if we want to keep going or answer questions. Okay. I can I can share the screen. You should see this light, right? I do. Okay. Okay. So thanks again for the kind invitation. I mean, it's a pleasure today to show you a little bit of uh, the work that we are doing together with uh, with uh, with Jason, and to have this very interesting brainstorming on AI and the implication uh, for vaccine development or for the development of new therapeutics. So just to start. Uh, how the process that we are um, following is going. This it all starts with this reverse vaccinology 2.0 approach, which is a method that has been described that back in 2016 by Rino Rappoli. And it is used to rapidly discover human monoclonal antibodies from people and to rapidly identify uh, antigens that can be used for vaccine development. The overall strategy, which is described here, just going to put it later. Uh, so starts with the collection of blood from people that either got vaccinated or have been exposed to a specific virus of pathogens in general. We collect the blood, we isolate the B cells, so the, the cells responsible for antibody production. We culture these cells for a couple of weeks so that they can naturally produce antibodies. And then these are tested directly for neutralization screening against the virus of interest to see whether they are able to neutralize or not the virus of interest. Those antibodies that show neutralization activity are then sequenced, recovered, and then expressed as recombinant protein. And when you express them as recombinant protein, then you can use these antibodies as tools to identify protective antigens and protective epitopes. And when you discover the antigen in the epitope, then you can go with the structural based antigen design and for vaccine development and then test them in clinical trials. As you can see, this part has been basically the overall, overall workflow has been split in two different parts. So we take care of the identification of human monoclonal antibodies, and then we share this with Jason. And Jason, of course, as one of the world pioneers in this structural biology based antigen design, and it will take care of identification of the antigen, um, vaccine design for vaccine development. So very recently, I mean, we are all very familiar by the fact that AI has vehemently found its space in life sciences and specifically in the prediction of structure in the structural biology field and the prediction of a protein structure. Uh, this very this schematized in a very simplistic way how the, these uh, generative models works for the prediction of the structures. So it, it basically starts with uh, feeding uh, antibody sequences, antigen sequences, structural data, 
then and then it is passed on into multiple layers of generative AI. So there is an input layer, first module that basically uh, feeds and uh, acquires all the sequences and all the information that the model has been fed with, and then subsequently it is passed into a, another layer, another module that assesses all the possible combinations, try to build the initial structure and assess the structures. And then it is passed to a, a final layer, an output layer that basically just uh, uh, assess the final structure and then provides the predictor structure of the protein of interest. There are there are several um, there are several tools now there, but definitely the most used and well known ones are AlphaFold three developed by DeepMind and the RosettaFold developed by the Institute of Protein Design at the University of Washington. And how does all of this fit with uh, antigen, uh, with the vaccine development field, actual therapeutics and vaccine development field? So this graph here shows you the, let's say, most novel uh, and new, actually, uh, technology of the past pretty much 20 years or so, and how this has evolved in the process of accelerating uh, um, antigen discovery for vaccine development. So at the end of the 1990s, beginning of 2000, so the, 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 genomic anal the genome analysis has been really um, an opportunity for vaccine development, a new methodology that has, has allowed to develop vaccines which were impossible with previous methodologies. And one of these was the meningococcus B vaccine, uh, a lot of decades passed without the possibility to develop it. And then when genome analysis entered the field of vaccine development, it was possible to spot new antigens that were impossible to find uh, before. And there, those were used to develop a meningococcus B uh, vaccine. Despite the entering of genome analysis, it still took like a lot of years from the genome sequencing to finding the right antigens and then to bring this to, to clinical uh, application. Then we enter the new phase with the reverse vaccinology 2.2 that I just described. So starting with the blood of people to isolate human monoclonal antibodies. And this really sped up the, the, sped up the process for antigen discovery and, uh, and vaccine development. And uh, one of the major cases, the RSV case, of course, and the seminal paper that uh, Jason and Barney Graham uh, produce on the stabilization of uh, the RSV uh, fusion protein, the F protein, in its pre-fusion conformation. Indeed, it was thanks to an antibody called D25, and I'm pretty sure Jason can explain this better, but it was thanks to an antibody that bounds to the apex of the F protein that was able to stabilize the protein in its pre-fusion state. And thanks to this observation, uh, Jason was able to stabilize the F protein in its pre-fusion. And from the uh, discovery of this in 2013 until the, the first clinical uh, trial in 2018, passed just five years from the stabilization to the first clinical trial. So it really sped up the process, sped up the process uh, for, for vaccine development. So what happens now with gen generative AI? So we really now can have an, an antigen discovery and structural prediction and structural uh, data at, at an unprecedented speed, really. We can pass from years to really few days from the production of the data set to the production of the predicted structure or the predicted complex from an antibodies to a specific uh, antigen. And this strategy can be used to tackle all the possible pathogens that pose a real threat for um, uh, global health. This is a list of pathogens that was published uh, last year by the NIH with all the pandemic potential pathogens. And this, this definitely this strategy is something that can be used um, translationally against all the pathogens listed here. And for the purpose of the presentation today, we're gonna focus on pox viruses that have been listed as one of the viruses with pandemic potential. Why pox viruses? I'm pretty sure you are all familiar now with uh, uh, all the alarmings and all the crisis that MPOX has been uh, leading since 2022. So 
if you, if uh, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, with all of this information, but just to uh, to be uh, all on the same page. So back before 2022, there were only 4,000 cases of Mpox infection only in in endemic region, or mainly almost exclusively in endemic region. And then after in during the 2022 outbreaks, there were more than 20 to uh, 92,000 cases all over the world. Luckily, the clay that spread globally was the clay 2P, which has been reported to be one with a pretty low uh, uh, fatality rate. Despite that, in the, the despite this outbreak uh, that occurred in low and high in, uh, income countries, the rollout of vaccines plus, plus behavioral adjustments really uh, managed to reduce uh, or to stop this crisis. But very recently, from the beginning of this year, basically, there was another major uh, MPOX outbreak, mainly in low middle income countries. There are 6,000 cases confirmed, but there are many, many more that have been uh, undetected or not laboratory confirmed. And these, in this case, is a clade 1B uh, MPOX, which is much more dangerous with a higher uh, fatality rate. And in both cases, 2022 and 2024, the WHO declared MPOX as a public health emergency of international concern. Despite there are some vaccines, they have major limitations. So, and there is no specific uh, vaccine for uh, monkeypox. Uh, there is no effective treatment. There is a tecovirimat that was tested and just recently the NIH released the data that it wasn't effective uh, to treat clade one MPOX. And another important thing is that uh, pox viruses in general, they are very largely unstudied. Uh, and there is so much that is still unknown in terms of the proteins that are involved in uh, uh, infection, in uh, that how the whole protein fusion machinery works. There is so, so much that is still unknown and can benefit from the approach that uh, we, we are trying to use. So this is what we have been doing right now, and this is where we are collaborating with Jason. So we have been collecting blood from people that they either got infected uh, with Mpox or have been vaccinated with the MVA uh, BM vaccine. We take their blood, we isolate the B cells, and we perform single cell sorting. So from these donors, we sorted over 15,000 memory B cells. And the cells that have been sorted have been all screened in biosafety level three laboratories for their neutralization activity, and we found 43 hits. And among these antibodies, the one that were most promising were also tested for neutralization against uh, other orthopox viruses like cowpox and vaccinia, and we found five antibodies that show level of cross neutralization. So, with the aim of identifying antibodies with cross neutralization activity against pox viruses to develop new therapeutics. And with the aim to discover new antigens, we decided to start, uh, we shared these antibodies with Jason and then started all the process that he's going to, the, to describe. I don't know if we want to take questions now or we do everything at the end. Probably, probably keep going maybe uh, till I get to the monkeypox part. Yeah, I think keep going. Yeah. We okay. do want to make some time for questions, so okay. you can assume a certain level of um, proficiency with from. Yeah. Got it. All right. Uh, all right. So I'm going to take over then from Manuela. All right. Uh, so as Manuela mentioned, that there are, uh, there are a lot of proteins on the surface of pox virus, and so the identification of the antigens is uh, much trickier than it would be for something like a coronavirus, where it's essentially spike or some of the other uh, RNA viruses. Um, so many possible targets uh, that uh, the antibodies that the Manuela isolated may recognize. And so one approach that we've been uh, working with recently is trying to use AlphaFold3 to predict antibody antigen structures. For some of our cases, it's performed well for respiratory syncytial virus, uh, F protein, and complex of antibodies. It was able to predict around 75% of uh, complexes by just providing it the, the VH, VL of the antibody and the sequence of the F protein. Um, 
we're using the, the confidence scores to sort of then help down select and identify those that we think are most promising to guide experiments. Uh, there's a, a recent uh, preprint from Jeffrey Gray uh, shown here. What has AlphaFold3 learned about antibody and nanobody docking and what remains unsolved? And so we sort of classify and compare it to AlphaFold2 multimer, uh, alpha red. Here's the AF3 server for antibodies. Uh, and they were getting maybe around a 40% success rate overall, taking into account acceptable, medium, and uh, high confidence docking. And so uh, this would be incorrect, where the AlphaFold3 antibody is really quite far from uh, the crystal structure antibody over here. Uh, this would be medium, where the, the antibodies are actually quite close. And then this would be uh, high. Uh, where essentially the, the antibodies are overlapping. Uh, and again, you see a, a nice uh, score associated with that. Uh, and so we've been trying to down select. So on June 19th in 2024, we, we started trying to uh, just start folding sequences, every like one-to-one -one complex of the 30 or so surface uh, pox virus proteins, plus the VHVL of the antibody. And we encountered this problem. Uh, it said sequence filtering encountered, uh, please see our FAQ, and, and we did. Uh, are there any restrictions on the protein sequences that are allowed? And yes, we are currently restricting sequences from a small number of viral pathogens. Um, and if you run a job that encounters the filter, please get in touch with the AlphaFold team. Uh, so I did, so I sent emails. Uh, took a lot a while to hear back, uh, but then essentially heard back that yes, they were filtering sequences for pox viruses. Uh, so then that was really frustrated. Uh, we offered several ways moving forward if they were interested, including collaborations, um, but that didn't go anywhere. Uh, so then I contacted colleagues at CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and um, they were able to get a meeting in place. Uh, and at the meeting, there still wasn't much uh, movement, uh, but they at least heard our concerns. They were kind of slowing down progress uh, on antibody and vaccine development for, for NPOX. And so that meeting occurred on August 5th. On the 14th, um, WHO declared NPOX a, a, a public health emergency. And then finally, on the 21st, a week later, we got an email from Jack Mason, um, basically saying that the, the viral sequence filter was going to be removed. So um, thanks for bringing... Uh, Thank you for your work on MPOX and the impact of the AlphaFold server. And uh, in light of our request in recent developments, including WHO de declaration, they've now removed the MPOX sequences from the, the viral sequence filter. You know, the whole time they were, I think, essentially suggesting that MPOX itself, um, th there wasn't a real need to filter MPOX, but there's more of a development of the filter or other use cases maybe in the future. Um, since that time, we've been performing all these pairwise comparisons or in predictions of the antigen with the different antibody sequences. Uh, we have some strong hits now. We think we've identified two, uh, two of the antibodies by the same antigen. It looks like in different ways. Uh, we're just experimentally verifying this. We have some other hits. Um, there's a lot of pairwise combinations, so we're, we're still moving forward, and we have some experimental ways, um, but we are excited to, to see this uh, moving forward. And we think maybe in the future with improvements to alpha full three or alpha full four or other things, you know, we might be able to populate the entire spreadsheet and identify all the antigens quickly uh, rather than going through any experimental approach. So maybe I don't, so I can pause there and we can take questions on uh, MPOX and the role of uh, alpha fold. Otherwise, I, I, have... would, I would just run through it there. So I'm going to come do, do what? Just keep going and we'll come to Okay. You. All right. So then maybe I'll quickly go through this in about five minutes or so. Um, another thing is using AI to design or assess stabilizing substitutions for viral fusion proteins. Uh, viral fusion proteins are really dynamic. They're important for fusing the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. Uh, they are little molecular machines that undergo substantial conformational changes. This is the coronavirus spike. It's a class one viral fusion protein. Um, you get these extensions and rearrangements as it enters uh, and sort of targets or prunes the fusion peptide into the target cell membrane. The molecule then continues to refold, 
pre-hairpin intermediate breaks down, you adopt a highly stable post-fusion structure that fuses the viral and host cell membranes. Uh, in general, we want to target the, the pre-fusion conformation, although that is metastable, uh, which is thermodynamically unstable, but kinetically trapped. And so generally when you express these proteins, you end up with the most stable form, the post-fusion form, but that's not what's on the surface of the virus. It's not what we want to present to the immune system. Uh, and so we use structure-based vaccine design to try to identify stabilizing substitutions that will lead uh, to molecules where we can express the pre-fusion state, it stays in the pre-fusion state and um, has enhanced immunogenicity. Uh, we sort of break this down into a series of different types of substitutions, including the introduction of disulfide bonds, cavity filling substitutions from small amino acids to large, electrostatic to form salt bridges, uh, the introduction of hydrogen bonds or the reduction in charge repulsion, as well as uh, proline substitutions in regions that need to go under conformational change. Inserting the uh, rigid prolines helps keep those regions from moving. Uh, this has worked very well. I'll just highlight a couple of quick examples. Our work on respiratory syncytial virus back in 2013, where we introduced a disulfide bond, two cavity filling substitutions led to this stabilized pre-F molecule uh, that elicited very high titers of neutralizing uh, antibodies in mice and rhesus macaques. So that's pre-fusion versus post-fusion. Higher is better. Uh, Pre-F molecules have now led to the, the first approved RSV vaccines from GSK and Pfizer. Uh, we've done similar work on human metanumovirus, again, trying to identify a series of substitutions uh, in those different categories. Uh, many of them boost uh, expression two or three fold, including this one that I like, this uh, valine to isoleucine gives us about a three fold boost in expression relative to the wild type. That's just the addition of a single methyl group. Uh, this is a substitution that was identified by one of the AIML software packages that we've used. Uh, we've also used proline scanning for coronavirus spikes. Uh, this is a region that undergoes a conformational change in the S2 subunit of coronavirus spikes. And so replacing those amino acids with prolines helps cap the helix, prevents the conformational rearrangement, we get a huge boost in expression. This is looking at MERS coronavirus back in 2017. Uh, it actually works well for all the beta coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so all four of the COVID-19 vaccines authorized for use in the US use the pre-fusion stabilized spike protein we developed that contains the two proline mutations at positions 986 and 987. We also went on to develop a, a second gen molecule that was even more stable, uh, contains six prolines, so we're able to boost expression considerably. That's now been incorporated into the vaccines approved for use in Mexico and Thailand. Um, the plasmid's been distributed to uh, 215 labs. And back to the AIML, a lot of that was done by just intuition, visual inspection. And, and so we're now using various tools to help identify these, these substitutions. Uh, this is one called Mute Compute X that was developed uh, here at UT Austin by uh, Adam Clivens, Danny Diaz, uh, Andy Ellington. It's a vision-based approach. It uses protein structures for input and training, essentially kind of focuses on uh, each individual amino acid, uh, highlights uh, the in chemical environment, removes the amino acid of interest, and then computes a probability for each of the 20 amino acids being found at that site based on its training set. Um, so, so that can be really helpful when we look at the log probability relative to, to wild type to identify uh, substitutions that should be uh, highly favored. Uh, Stability Oracle uh, is, a, is another tool developed by Adam Clivens and Danny Diaz here. I think this was just published. Um, this fine tunes MuCompute X on some thermodynamic stability data that was made available. Uh, so rather than producing the probability of identifying uh, a, a substitution in that environment, it tries to calculate the delta delta G, the free energy change associated with every substitution possible. Uh, protein MPNN is one from the Baker Lab. Um, this one is maybe how we use this, maybe not exactly how it's intended, but uh, you give it input structure, extracts the backbone, then identifies sequences that will still fold into the same backbone. 
but it also does provide access to an underlying like probability matrix for every amino acid at every position. And so again, we can identify positive substitutions. Um, we can look at sort of how these perform. Um, this is RSVF. We can look at two of the substitutions. So uh, serine 190F, this is one of the, the ones we identified. It's in the, uh, the DSCAV1 structure. Uh, if we can look at uh, for, uh, for the delta delta G models, stability oracle favors that one. It's predicting a uh, minus 1.0 kcal per mole. Um, these other two did not. If we look at the log probability, both mucompute X and protein MPNN both uh, find this favorable. Uh, so that's good. B207L, which we also like, uh, and works well in conjunction with uh, S190F. That one is not really picked up by, by any of these tools. Uh, if we look at Hexapro and the four additional prolines that we added, it's a little bit of a scatter. Um, phenylalanine 817 uh, to proline. These delta delta G models don't really identify it as a strong candidate, but MuComputex and protein MPNN both find this favorable. A892P, uh, which is over here, MuComputex really likes it, uh, finds it very favorable. Protein MPNN thinks it's neutral. Uh, Stability Oracle also finds it favorable. Not many of them uh, really picked up the 899. A942P is a really important one. That, that one gives almost a six-fold boost in expression on its own. Uh, the Delta Delta G models find it unfavorable to neutral. Mu Compute finds it neutral, whereas Protein MPN finds it favorable. Um, I can also show you something similar with HMPVF. Again, we see different things for the different models. This V231i, uh, strongly identified by mu compute X, also favored by protein MPNN, and, and identified as somewhat stabilizing by, by the delta delta G. So uh, we see a little bit of a spread of false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. Uh, hopefully this will improve over time. There continues to be a lot of new research in this area, constant tool development. Uh, this is a nice paper from Ava Maria Strauch, uh, I think former Baker Lab member, looking at uh, trying to create an entire pipeline, looking at pre-fusion, post-fusion, identifying substitutions that favor pre, disfavor post. Uh, she was able to identify some stabilizing substitutions. Here's a new tool for proline scanning uh, from the Pierce Lab called ProScan, kind of looks at every amino acid, the substitution of proline modeling, um, and then identifies individual candidates. So it's an exciting time and there's a lot of advances. And I think ideally the goal would be to go from a novel viral sequence uh, or genome uh, being made available to predicted structures of the glycoproteins and their different confirmations, and then a suite of tools to identify stabilizing substitutions that would keep the protein in the prefusion state boost expression and stability. And then that could be produced by uh, mRNA um, and to produce vaccines, like all in silico, all in a matter of, of hours. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, both of you. Um, I will open it up for questions. Mike, go check our mic is already off the races. <laughs> Um, hi, Jason. This is Mike Imperiali. So I, I, okay. I'm hoping I can buy some of what you've been talking about now into our task. So as a virologist, right, if I wanted to look for antibody escape mutants, right, I would grow the virus in the presence of the neutralizing antibody and see what grows out. And so I'm getting selection for two things there, right? One is evasion of the antibody, and the second is a virus that's still viable, yep. right? Okay, so how good is AI at doing that task right now. And, mm -hmm. and push is, how does that work in terms of both potential benefits, but also then the potential to, if someone wanted to do that to cause harm, like a beta vaccine, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm unaware of any AI tool that is trained to do what you're describing, to identify antibody escape substitutions that keep viability uh, or infectivity of the pathogen. Um, at least on the single tool, I, I suppose it would be maybe relatively straightforward to identify substitutions that would be 
likely to decrease the affinity of an antibody if the antibody, if the structure is known, right? Um, so maybe that's one question in your hypothetical, do we know the structure of the antibody antigen complex? But does it matter? I mean, like just to play devil's advocate with the technology that you have, if I, if an actor is making an escape virus with this new glycoprotein and whatever, you would take exactly the same approach as you outlined and you would take that new glycoprotein and you would look for stabilization uh, substitutions and then make new antibodies against that. Uh, well, no, I, I think you do need a structure as, as the programs are going to be looking at the, the interfaces and trying to calculate substitutions that decrease the affinity for the antibody while perhaps also preserving the affinity for the receptor uh, in case of something like spike. Um, if you didn't yeah, have- the virus would be out there, right? I mean, I can, I can create any kind of um, whatever bad virus in a hypothetical scenario, but at some point, um, uh, once it's released and it infects people and it does things, you will go back to that particular structure. I mean, it's like a natural, a naturally evolving variant um, from a from a practical point of view. I mean, it, you you can create something that is against something that is licensed, so you can get a head start, of course. Um, AI is so quick with all of these doing, then you can actually come up with countermeasures also relatively quick. Hopefully. I see. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I suppose you could, yeah, if, if there was an available countermeasure, a single monoclonal antibody, um, I guess you could try to engineer a virus uh, that, that escaped the binding. Um, I think maybe early in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, there were groups attempting to do that. Um, I'd have to think about that. I mean, you would still need to then perform the reverse genetics and produce the virus. Put it into people. Uh, not all people are going to be uh, exp are going to be uh, passively immunized with the antibody. So uh, the virus is still going to evolve and drift, and that substitution is detrimental or is not needed. It would it would revert. Uh, our own bodies are going to be putting immune pressure on it. So uh, it seems like a really un unlikely scenario, but. Yeah, I guess I guess where, where I'm going with this yep. is the question of given the number of people uh, in the community looking for uh, solutions and for countermeasures and, and and the experts that are out there of viruses, how likely is it that an AI tool gives a, a sole actor or a group such an advantage that they can completely outcompete that other larger group that also has tools like AI? available for medical countermeasures, i.e. are we not always a step ahead of the of the bad actors? Well, uh, it's a great sorry question. For the, sorry for the time. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that, that's kind of outside my area of expertise. It's, yeah, it's kind of a hypothetical. Uh, I still think the virus evolving in vivo is, 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 is much more of a concern than somebody trying to make or create a virus that then needs to be infective and spread and will be under dr drift and pressure from the human immune system. Um, yeah, most of these viruses are very finely tuned. Um, I mean, there's other ways of identifying escape mutations like Jesse Bloom's type of technology, um, just looking, uh, screening, making entire libraries and identifying point substitutions that don't prevent antibody binding. No, Emmanuel, do you want to weigh in? Do you have some yeah. thoughts? I, I was just thinking about it because now, I mean, you can see the use of these tools for what they, but you can see it also in the other way around. So now at the beginning you, with, with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, you had one antibody, you are ready to go. You just wanted to go to clinic. And I mean, you really didn't look that much at the structure or to possible escape mutation, et cetera. Now, before doing anything like that, you really can use these tools to map those portion that really does not mutate or uh, they are they impair the viral fitness or you just try to target those uh, portion of the virus that are very difficult to mutate because will be detrimental for the virus itself, for instance. So you can now develop tools that are much more resistant to possible escape mutants compared to what was the beginning. If we are talking about a virus and now we do know very well of course, for next whatever uh, disease X or something that can come up, that, then it's going to be different. But the technology that we do have right now will allow us to be much more thoughtful on what we're going to select 
for uh, development of therapeutics and, and vaccine design. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I'm, uh, I'd like you to, uh, so why do you think it took so long to get the restrictions lifted on the, uh, you know, to be able to counter MPOTS and, and what was the reason they gave for that delay? And um, is that delay uh, going to be removed in the future? Are they modifying their filter to be able to address that in the future? Yeah, those are great questions that I'd love to have the answer to, and I, I don't know them. Uh, it was really, uh, I thought it was really frustrating. They essentially acknowledged that there there is no practical need to have a filter on on MPOX or the or pox viruses, but they chose it as a way to test the filter, uh, which was really unsatisfying. And even when we showed how it was detrimental to the advance of science and, and trying to create countermeasures against the MPOX outbreaks, uh, they still, they didn't do anything. Uh, even after meeting with us, we offered several solutions. We thought maybe they could set up a separate server that we would just have access to, or we could send them the sequences and they could fold it internally. Um, but there was no no movement until WHO uh, declared it as a public health emergency of international concern. And then a, a week later we got the email and that's that's been the only communication. Yeah. That's really unsatisfying. <laughs> Patrick, do you have a... Yeah, I think it kind of demonstrates, yeah, what, what can happen if a commercial entity is in charge of a really powerful tool. Um, well, my next question is going to take it in a different direction. So if you want to, I guess, you know, you describe your workflow from going from a novel genome sequence to identifying an antigen and developing a pre-fusion stabilized version of that, of that antigen. Um, let's say you were told, like, you have no wet lab access at all. Um, what do you think the success rate would be for going from a novel viral sequence to a successfully presented pre-fusion stabilized um, antigen? Uh, so, so I think it would depend strongly on the type of virus and the type of uh, fusion proteins that exist on the surface. If it's a class one viral fusion protein, like those for influenza HA, HIV envelope, coronavirus spike, RSVF, uh, I actually think it's pretty high. And, and the most recent paper from Ava Maria Strauch was really impressive. Um, where she only needed to make like four different variants and one or two out of each of those had prefusion stability, look good uh, immunogenetically. The, uh, if it uses a class two, class three viral fusion protein, those, those were still in the very early days of working on that. That's something we're being funded by for CEPI and these new U19 revamps to try to do pandemic preparedness, um, understand how to make the best antigens for different viral families of the viral families most likely to spill over. Um, but I, I still think we're kind of far away on five to 10 years away before we'd have high confidence that you maybe need to make five mRNAs and one of them would work. And, and do the new, like do AI tools help lower the barrier for accessing design for those class, class two pathogens or does that depend on basically background knowledge that's related to the understanding of the viruses themselves? Yeah, I, I don't think it's helped yet. I mean, we've been throwing them. Uh, I think we've now figured out how to stabilize class three viral fusion proteins. We have a paper out in PNAS uh, to do it for cytomegalovirus and we have some others, uh, the related uh, GB proteins from different herpes viruses. So I think we have an understanding. Um, yeah, but a lot of times it's, it's not just the substitutions, it's understanding how they work, how they combine. Uh, and then once you get enough experimental data, I think you start to understand the universality, uh, which regions you need to stabilize, which regions to avoid. Uh, and then maybe the AI tools become more helpful in identifying substitutions in, in those regions. Uh, but yeah, you also have to understand something about like the, the protein folding. Um, you know, a lot of times you're designing based on a static structure and without any appreci appreciation for how it folds into that structure. And so some substitutions look great if the protein was already in that structure, but they kill the pathway the protein needs to fold to get there. Um, and so there's still some experimental need involved uh, as we try to figure out that. But just to clarify, right? Yeah. This is how to make an antigen. This is, this is how to make an antigen. Not, this is not how to make a virus. a virus. No, and everything, yeah, and everything, all these substitutions, essentially kill infectivity. Like the virus has evolved a perfect amount of metastability to be both slightly unstable, slightly stable. Uh, and everything we're doing is 
uh, would essentially make dead virus if, if you could even introduce these substitutions. Great. I think that's a key point that a lot of people don't pick up on, but wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, when we say we're stabilizing it and making it better, like it would, it would be completely detrimental to the virus. And we showed that with a pseudovirus assay for coronavirus. If we introduce the two prolines, um, the pseudovirus just could not infect at all. It was completely dead. Thank you, Mike. Hey, Jason, this is Mike again. So your, your answer to Patrick's question, so that this means basically if you if there's a new virus and there's no cell culture system like Hep C 20 years ago, mm -hmm. do all this prediction and come up with a potential vaccine, even if you can't grow the virus, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think you could do that now, right? To, with, with some extent, once you figure out what the glycoproteins are, you could just encode them in mRNA. Uh, and, and try to use the wild type sequence, and that would that would likely express in human cells. Um, you'd get some antibodies against it, and it would just be a matter of is is that sufficient or not. And what we what we try to do is just optimize and improve and improve upon that because the virus did not evolve to make great vaccine antigens. Um, that that's what we're we're trying to add to that. But even now, you could just encode wild type, and you know that that could work uh, for coronavirus. Um, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine was just wild type spike with no modifications. Uh, so that was different than the other four that used our, our two prolines, but that, that was a uh, reasonably good vaccine. So I want to ask one question with the last minute. Um, for both of you, one of the things we're trying to identify is what is the delta? Like how much has AI changed X, Y, or Z? So could you just say how much do you think AI has changed the, the speed of countermeasure development for vaccines, Jason, and then Manuel for antibody discovery. Um, yeah. For, va for vaccines, I would say not, not a lot. Uh, I, I don't think the Delta has been that substantial yet. Um, and as we showed, we've been benchmarking these tools and you still get a lot of false positives, false negatives. Um, Sometimes we have to go really far down a list of, of 200 substitutions the program predicts before we find a good one. Um, but we're also generating a lot of data. I think that the growth will be rapid. Uh, but yeah, it is it, it is still tricky. And then especially when you do combinations of substitutions, um, it, it can be hard to predict whether those are additive uh, or not. So as of now, no, but I think everything's going to get faster, but we still need to put a lot of things to carbon, test them out in the lab, and then uh, maybe use those data to retrain and, and focus specifically on viral fusion proteins or antigens of interest. So, when, when you, sorry. so maybe just a quick follow-up there. Yeah. When you, but if you think about structure prediction. Yeah. So... Um, how long did it take you to solve the structure of coronavirus versus how long did it take you to do it now? Uh, it took us about 30 days to go from the genome sequence being made available uh, online to our submitted manuscript describing the SARS-CoV-2 spike structure. Now, uh, you know, it would be on the order of minutes for, for spike. It, it, there's also hundreds of, of spike structures in the database and there's a lot. If it was something completely novel, um, you know, it, it might be difficult. There are still some higher order complexes and other things uh, for some bunya viruses, for instance, those have higher order arrangements. Um, AlphaFold struggles with, with some of that, but the prediction is obviously very fast. The design of bona fide substitutions that improve expression and stability, where I think we still have a lot of work to do, particularly for non-class one viral fusion proteins. Yeah. Probably, I don't think that's important for the uh, for your estimation that there was not much progress in terms of time for the vaccine development. Because so I, you're triggering a little bit of trauma in me. Because uh, in, in 1996, one of my first rotations was at Joe Zodrowski's lab trying to create, uh, you know, trimer for for GP160. Yep. Um, and of course, you know, I worked on this only for a summer. He worked on this for forever. Um, so uh, if if you calculate that in as a first step for your vaccine or antibody production time, wouldn't you say that there has been massive acceleration then, despite the back end of the vaccine development where you have now um, the, the stabilized trimer, and now you need to create all the antibodies and then you create the vaccine or whatever. That part might not have changed, but the front end has changed a lot. 
Uh, yeah, I, I guess I was limiting it just just to how AI has improved the the identification of stabilizing substitutions. As yeah, I mean, you would not have a grad student anymore and simply um, figure out that maybe we're trying this particular loop and then make six point mutants and they don't work. I mean, you actually have a way forward of. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you have a way forward, but you still don't know. Like the program predicts or calculates a probability or a free energy for every substitution at every amino acid. Uh, you can then rank them, but what I'm trying to say is like the, the ranking isn't optimal and there's still lots of noise uh, along with some signal in there. So maybe you have a better sense of uh, substitutions to try, but it's still a lot of work to, to test them all experimentally in the, in yeah. the lab. Although there are approaches to, to high throughput screening and yeast display or mammalian display. Um, so there are advances. And then related to an antibody discovering? Yeah, I, I think where it really helps this in case, of course, in case of class one and proteins of proteins of this kind, you can really understand and characterize your antibodies and uh, an unprecedented speed. Now, if you have an antibodies and you would just want to dump it on a spike protein, it's going to predict it with a very, very high score. So even if you want to want to select antibodies based on the position that it recognizes, on the epitope that it recognizes on the uh, on the of, on the antigen, I mean that is going to be much much faster than any other experimental approach. And this is true for RSV. This is true for what all those um, proteins that has a lot of structural information up there. So from this point of view, I think it really really accelerates AI. Really really accelerates the possible down selection of uh, candidate antibodies. And also from an antigen discovery point of view, it also again falls down to which antigens are we talking about. But uh, if you have to test for a lot of different uh, surface uh, antigens, it's going to be much, this is this could be a very quick way at least to select some of the proteins in case you start. I mean, now we are talking about viruses. Uh, and, uh, orthobox virus is probably one of the, arguably one of the most complex, a lot of like over 200 proteins they can express on the surface, they have a lot of proteins, but you start doing like bacteria, when you start having 200, 300 different proteins on the surface, and you can use some tools just to down select, that, that could be really, really a high acceleration of, of the process. Yeah. And maybe one point for where the field's going for AI is to just look at an antigen and say, make an antibody here and then have it de novo fold. So you're not even isolating anti antibodies, you're generating them against surfaces of interest. Um, and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of work in that area. Okay, do you have a very quick question? I think, I hope it might be. Very quick question. Okay. Yeah. Something else that we're thinking about is the, the data that goes along with these experiments. And so when you're, when you're talking about the limitations of the tools, what are the types of data or information that you would need to have more confidence in the results? I don't know if that's like experimental. Yeah, yeah it would be yeah, generally experimental um, and, and that we would need uh, expression data and stability data, um, possibly even structural data for, for, for certain things. It depends on how good, the, what, collection of antibodies are available to recognize conformational differences. And you collect that data now when you're doing validation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we've been working uh, with some colleagues at Houston Methodist, Jimmy Gallagher's group. Um, I mean, we've been working on Lassa virus, GPC. They, I think Jimmy's made 1400 variants of that protein, um, different combinations of stabilizing substitutions. We have structures, uh, we have antibody recognition. So we're generating large panels of, of data and where does that data go after you generate it? Uh, it's a good question. We haven't published on it yet, but presumably it will be in the in the published uh, sphere and supplemental. Uh, this is work being paid uh, by CEPI. So I think uh, we, we may have to turn it over to, to some database that CEPI controls. Yeah, no, sorry. I just, uh, because I think that if it doesn't make its way out into some other type of form beyond supplemental materials and a paper, then doesn't necessarily get ingested in the way that would be helpful mm -hmm. to making the models more powerful moving forward. So I appreciate you letting me go on that little spelunking. Yeah.
No, I think that's great. I mean, a lot of what people train these models on are a subset of a protein database of highly stable, small, maybe bacterial, and we don't even know if that's biasing it for something like uh, heterotrimeric, glycosylated, metastable fusion proteins. And maybe you need special data sets just for those types of proteins, for instance. Yeah, thank you. All right, with that, I think we will uh, let you guys, you to go. Thank you very much, um, uh, Jason and Manuel. Uh, and we will reconvene in five minutes um, at half past the hour. Thanks. Good. Have a good rest of the day. Thank, thank you so much. Bye bye. So, thank you. Welcome back. Um, uh, we're now joined by Benjamin Brown, the Director of Facilities Division at the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research at the Department of Energy. The division's recent accomplishments include the successful deployment of the world's first exascale supercomputer, Frontier. Ben is also the lead architect of the department's integrated research infrastructure, IRI, effort to excel to accelerate the pace and discovery of innovation through seamless interoperability of experimental observational, computational network and data infrastructure. So um, welcome, Ben. Thanks very much. Sorry to have kept you for five minutes while we uh, waited to start. Um, uh, it'd be great to have a quick presentation, and then we'll open it up for uh, discussion from the community. Over to you. Thank you very much. And so I wasn't quite sure what uh, ground to cover today, so I'm going to apologize for the pace I'm going to do uh, with my slides. I meant for them to be a sort of very broad sweep of various aspects of the DOE uh, advanced computing enterprise that connect to the life sciences and biosecurity. And um, my goal is to go at quite a breakneck pace so that there's time for discussion and that these are leave behind. So I intend them to be also, if there's something in the slides that you'd like to hear more about, because I'm going to go fast, uh, you can rewind me and I can connect you to someone else at DOE who can go even deeper. So as I said, we're going to touch on a variety of things. I want to touch on the major uh, DOE effort in AI for science and our FAST initiative. I'm going to situate the advanced computing research infrastructure in the broader context of our, or sorry, the, uh, the Oscar facilities that, that I'm privileged to oversee and steward in the broader context of research infrastructure in DOE. I want to touch on the integrated research infrastructure program, a few examples of life sciences research going on right now that are just hot off the presses. I want to touch on DOE's Bio Preparedness Research Virtual Environment, or BRAVE, program, and a couple of slides on our National AI Research Resource uh, NAIR Secure Pilot that we're co-leading with NIH. Uh, you may have seen this report. I'm going to flash a few report covers throughout the deck just to kind of make sure that you're aware of them in case you're not. Uh, we've had a multi-year planning effort that we call AI for Science, which has germinated uh, into an officially named initiative for the Department of Energy called FAST, the Frontiers in AI for Science Security Technology. The main message here is that this is like many mission agencies, there's longstanding efforts in AI that are ripening into a named major initiative, making the play for greater resources. And that goes across all mission areas at DOE. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Office of Science, we're the part of DOE that's the basic research funding and basic and major research infrastructure component of DOE. So we're uh, just north of $8 billion in annual appropriations. I am in one of the six major science program offices. So most of those congressional appropriations flow through these top uh, six boxes on this chart. I'm in the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program that not only deploys the major supercomputers, as we'll talk about, but also has longstanding investments in fundamental applied mathematics, computational science, and computer science. Just a quick Leave behind slide of the DOE National Laboratory System. On the right-hand side, a list of all of these major user facilities, as we call them, these major research infrastructures. And this pictograph sort of represents that there's a really wide range of these tools. And in the life sciences, there are, of course, direct investments by the Biological Environmental Research Program. And I know Kirsten is with you uh, and your group, uh, the Joint Genome Institute, uh, Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, at Pacific Northwest. There's also BER investments in the um, uh, the X-ray light sources and neutron sources. Uh, they have end stations that are used by the life sciences community. And that's a multi-decade story of how that came to be. Our nanoscience centers support a variety of work and of course our computing centers, which I'll focus on. And the major stewardship tenet of this enterprise is that these are publicly financed annually uh, funded through congressional appropriations, free for non-proprietary use. 
used by tens of thousands of researchers across the nation and the globe. So the next phase of my talk, I'm going to speak to the, the Oscar facilities. So if you've heard of the major supercomputing centers, they're at Argonne National Lab outside of Chicago, Oak Ridge uh, National Lab in Tennessee. Uh, the NERSC Center is at Berkeley Lab in California, and then our High Performance Network, which is actually one of only two coast-to-coast -coast and intercontinental research and education networks in the United States, the other one being Internet2. And this is a leave-behind slide. The main message I'm trying to communicate here is that in, in the program where I'm at, we have to keep, we have to make sure that assets are available for the research community at all times. This is job number one. We never want to have gaps between our deployed systems. And so we have these rolling waves of upgrades of deploying the next systems. This is quite challenging. These systems are incredibly expensive. They're incredibly energy intensive, but we take very seriously as job number one is never go dark. I'm going to end with this same slide, uh, but I'm putting it here to signal that as we look across the usage of these systems for more than a decade now, we're seeing really rich melding of approaches in computational science. And on the right-hand slide, it's sort of I represent with this little Venn diagram of traditional modeling and simulation, which going back to the 1960s, 70s, and 80s was really the main use for large-scale compute over the last can't really pick a number, but decade, 15 years, has really become completely intertwined with invoking modern uh, AI tools. Although people have been using optimization and search for all kinds of all kinds of uh, ways in their in the research for for many years. Of course, we know that those tools have are at an inflection point, and the coupling of that with experimental observational data analysis. The left hand side is meant to illustrate that it's not just about the compute, the movement and placement of data. The difficulty that researchers have in integrating disparate data and, and therefore you rely on the network all these pieces of the back-end infrastructure are present in so much of our work now so another pastiche of report covers there's been a variety of thrusts that can be kind of dizzying when you, i know from the outside trying to get familiar with doe and the office of science to lock in on what's current what's salient there are multiple fronts in which we've been attacking the era, trying to open up new avenues, uh, push back the frontier of what's possible at the largest scales of computation. The Exascale Computing Project, you may have heard about, I'll touch on briefly. I mentioned already AI for science, energy security, and I'll also mention this integrated research infrastructure effort. But I do also want to highlight that in all those kind of top down, big picture uh, strategic efforts, they're tightly coupled with formalisms we have for requirements gathering. And so I wanted to highlight a particularly useful report. There's uh, a what we call a, a requirements review report for the Biological Environmental Research Program. So if, if, if you're seeking sort of an avenue to get a little deeper into a case study understanding of the practice of science for some of these life sciences examples in DOE, uh, the, the report here, the BER ESNet report is particularly useful. The Exascale Computing Program wasn't just about deploying these first of uh, their kind Exascale supercomputers. It was more about actually making sure that scientific communities can use them productively on day one in a multi-year, $1.8 billion effort to mature the AI-ready, I mean GPU-ready applications and the software stack underneath them. So several of these apps are germane to the life sciences community. I'm going to very briskly step through a snapshot view into today with these Oscar facilities that I steward. And first, I'm going to lead off with the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, which is the home of Frontier, the nation's first exascale supercomputer. Uh, I don't know if anyone's interested in the speeds and feeds kind of stuff, but if you just leave the slide here in case you want you know, more information on sort of technology behind the scenes, these are gargantuan systems at Oak Ridge and, and Argonne, uh, roughly 30,000 GPUs in, in Frontier but not architected solely to do amazing AI things. They are, these are rich computational environments to support a really broad range of scientific applications. This is a slide that Oak Ridge presented just last Thursday at our um, one of our uh, uh, federal advisory committee meetings. We, we have them maybe two or three times a year. So it's quite recent. And I point your attention to, you know, the practice of operating this facility is not just a, uh, 
if you you know if you build it they will come there's an enormous effort that i would call this the science engagement piece you know the staff at oak ridge leadership computing facility working hand in hand in partnership with researchers to get their work alive and kicking on frontier and this complicated mosaic is their in-house analysis of what they're seeing for ai and ml workloads uh, on frontier today and you can see biology represented here on the left hand column and i think one takeaway is that because it's a quite technical slide that there's a lot of sophistication and breadth to the invocation of AI and ML tools in the biology, biology and life sciences work that they're seeing on Frontier, even just one year into um, the, the life cycle of that major system. Um, Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, uh, the second uh, exascale system that we're deploying is even larger. It's like using the word gargantuan, maybe overused. It's almost twice as large physically as Frontier. And uh, they celebrated uh, a benchmark this year in terms of getting the system. Uh, it's, it's not in. It's not ready for open science quite yet, but it's getting close. This is another slide from our federal advisory committee last week, where I'll point your attention to the lower half of the slide, where here are two early science examples. So not even in, for the open science community yet. These are sort of early users who are very tolerant of a buggy, hard to use system. We have here uh, a drug screening and infant scaling example on Aurora, where you're trying to do a massive, use the massive scale of the system to do uh, pre-screening uh, in silico. And then on the left, um, and, uh, a brain mapping uh, project. So th these are not things that sort of land out of the, out of the blue sky uh, onto a system like uh, Aurora or Frontier for that matter. There are uh, research groups that have been partnering and, and applying for time and winning uh, allocations with these centers. But I just wanted to give you a flavor that that's happening now and there's a rich history there. At NERSC at Berkeley Lab, which is our sort of in-house DOE system dedicated to the Office of Science funded research community, uh, NERSC is turning 50 this year, very special milestone. I've Although we fixate on the leadership class machines, enormous user community at NERSC Fully 50% of the 10,000 users are early career graduate student and postdocs. So if you're interested, I don't know the directions of your of your study. Uh, humbly, I'm ignorant to the questions that are on your minds. But if you want a perspective on sort of how the early career research community is orienting to the use of AI in the life sciences, the nurse team would be available to answer those questions. And here's another highlight slide from last week. Another example, a life science example, I think it's illustrative that you know, when we put out the call for what's the, what are the things you'd like to highlight NERSC or the LCFs as, as we stand in public and tout and celebrate achievements, it is it is not atypical that they come forward with some exciting example from the biological or life sciences. This one being about, I think, uh, the Donovo design of, of protein assemblies in silico. I would be remiss not to mention ESNet. And as we pivot to sort of talking about workflows across time and space, and, and especially examples we'll get to with the NAIR secure pilot of examples where you're doing, for example, federated learning where data can't move. Uh, we're extremely privileged in DOE to have decades of investment in ESNet, this coast-to-coast -coast high performance network purpose built for science. Our contemplation of what we call the integrated research infrastructure, which I know is a complicated slide, but essentially the message is how can we make all of this the wealth of, of research infrastructure work seamlessly to alleviate the complexity for performers in composing complex workflows that might draw data from, say, a protein crystallography beamline at the advanced light source, meld that with a, a simulation going on at Oak Ridge, and turn that analysis around in time to inform the experiment at the beamline, uh, maybe with an AI decision agent in the middle. So researchers, Plurializers have been doing pieces of this for years, as I'm sure you've heard from Kirsten, but it is a it is a sort of holy grail issue of how could you make this performant, seamless, automated, programmable in some sense, and, and, and enable new modes of, of the practice of science. Ultimately, this is about empowering people to manage increasingly difficult, even impossible volumes and velocities of data. And COVID illustrated this in spades, so we, you know, the that the Linux coherent light source at Slack National Lab, ex exquisitely high brightness, uh, free electron laser uh, materials probe. In the COVID era, we were able to do some rapid turnaround of the 
of the structural uh, characterization of the SARS-CoV-2 virus only because, again, some trailblazers between Slack and NERSC had been working for years to sort of handcraft that, that workflow across ESnet. The integrated research infrastructure blueprint activity that Kirsten was a part of uh, took that to the next level of maturity and trying to develop an, a technical policy and you know, sociological approach to tackling the integration challenge. And integration is a kind of, I call it kind of a dirty word. It's like the highest order expression of partnership. How could you actually link different research infrastructures and institutions together in, in, a, in a seamless way, both back of house, but in the human dimension to make these workflows a reality? Today, a couple of years on, a few years on from the pandemic, you know, uh, just recently, uh, Slack and Oak Ridge announced they uh, had come, created a rudimentary advanced workflow data pipeline that they call a data portal. So I'm just trying to illustrate that the work is ongoing piece by piece with more intentionality and top-down strategy for the technical roadmap and the software ecosystem that's needed to enable these research workflows that we know are not easy to characterize and that we want to build, frankly, a rich software and hardware ecosystem that's extensible and to new use cases. And software is infrastructure, and that's another huge component of, of our thinking. And, and similarly, demonstrating the ripening of this strategic emphasis for DOE, last year we launched formally our High Performance Data Facility Project, which is scoped as a 300 to $500 million multi-year project to create a fifth major Oscar facility with a mission focused on data lifecycle stewardship. Now, rounding the home stretch here, I'm watching the clock intently. I want to make sure we have time for questions. I want to credit my colleague in the Office of Science, Michelle Buchanan, who has some wonderful slides summarizing the BRAVE initiative, the BRAVE program, which emerged from the pandemic. Uh, the DOE's sort of kitchen sink, throw everything you've got at the pandemic. Uh, Poster Child is the National Virtual Biotechnology Laboratory. And that really was, you know, bring it all, bring it now to the challenge of at whatever R&D tools the department uh, had in its possession to any aspect of, of the challenges that COVID presented, alluded to the biomolecular characterization piece and, vir and uh, antiviral and uh, uh, the, the uh, well, the brain has just gotten kind of jammed up there. The, the things we stick in our arm and make us healthy. Uh, that piece of the puzzle and the uh, the efforts to understand the epidemiology of the pandemic, there's a broad range of research activities encapsulated in, in that initial effort in 2020 through 2022 that uh, manifested in a new program in DOE. So the BRAVE program was built bottoms up, uh, you know, from the lessons learned of the pandemic, how can we as a research community and as the Department of Energy with our unique research infrastructure, be in a better position going forward for biopreparedness. Um, I can provide, I want to walk through all these uh, slides now that will be at your disposal, but there are uh, the methodology, the programmatics that DOE rolled out was to do a formal, you know, research requirements workshop after the pandemic sort of pressure of that had, had relaxed and then identify priority research directions, and then have an open funding call to the DOE National Labs and partners. This is the list of active projects. In the yellow middle bit, there are two in particular that focus on creating the infrastructure and tools to support decision analysis, uh, and or rather for decision support in the living world, whether that's epidemiology, whether that's drug design, but they're heavily about data integration. So I wanted to highlight them in particular as perhaps relevant to your work. That's these two projects. Uh, one at, from Heidi Hansen at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's on, yeah, surveillance and scale for pandemic readiness. And then a second one, which is more uh, around epidemiology, uh, led by Peter Nugent at the Berkeley Lab. Lastly, I think my last couple of slides here just signal that Parallel to all that in the in the white hot time that we are in the AI era post eruption of ChatGPT, there's an interagency effort to uh, called the National AI Research Resource led by the National Science Foundation. That's a heavily uh, multi-agency effort uh, to create a set of resources that are available broadly to the research community to advance AI research goals. And there are broad set of goals here, including broadening participation and sort of unlocking the potential of a wider array of performers and a diverse research community, 
all the way to providing, frankly, a public sector ballast to the private sector's uh, sort of hegemony in, in their preserve of, of AI research tools. And there are three active, just getting going, uh, what we call NAIR secure pilot demonstration projects, all of which have to do with, in some measure, integrating uh, data that uh, can't move, whether that's federated learning or dealing with copyright uh, issues and the training of large language models uh, and uh, in general, this sort of data integration challenge. And the hallmark of all these being that with protected health information, data can't move typically and that there are big challenges there. Last slide, uh, we just came through in this past year a, a once in a decade assessment of our major projects across the Office of Science, including the supercomputing, networking, and data infrastructure. And there's a wonderful report from our advisory committee that sort of lays out the, what the next 10-year vision uh, should look like in the opinion of our advisory committee. So with that, let me stop there and take your questions. Hopefully that wasn't too dizzying a pace. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and I will open the, this up for questions from the committee. Um, um, I have some silly questions, and I, I just uh, I apologize. I know nothing about the stuff that you do there. So um, I guess my first question uh, is: um, who who can potentially compete with all of this? Um, in terms of nations, I mean, are there you know are, are there twenty nations on your on 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 the trail here, or like five? I mean, I, I don't want you to name nations necessarily, but you know, just like a question of like who can do this kind of stuff. And then my second question is, um, assuming that really complex, really critical problems can be solved with this kind of supercomputing power, which of course automatically will go into military applications, defense, offense, whatnot. Um, what is, how does backup work for these kind of things? So like um, you have a problem, the computer calculates nicely for like a few months on something, um, and then the facility explodes. Where, 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 do, where do the data go? How can you recreate this in some form? Can you recreate it? So on the first question, it's a pretty consistent picture if you look through a microelectronics lens, supercomputing lens, or a major research infrastructure investment lens, that uh, there are only a few countries in the world that really have this, you know, are on par with this level of investment in terms of supercomputing and major research infrastructure. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's, it's not a problem to name names. So uh, Japan, Western Europe, the UK, uh, and, and there within Western Europe, uh, in Germany, in particular Helmholtz is, you know, the, a laboratory system is really the only peer to the DOE laboratory system in terms of the diversity of centrally stewarded research infrastructure. And in all, I think, more in the EU than in Japan, we see overt investments in the sort of data integration challenge, meaning wanting to draw out that or fill in that that gap between. Um, let me say it this way: the same things I just illustrated. There's there's a recognition of the strategic importance to interconnect the research infrastructure so that you can make. Uh, data integration uh, and the action of AI tools on large data more performant than it is today. To your second question, so the there's a big distinction in the DOE actually between the open science program where I sit and the picture I just described and our the National Nuclear Security Administration, the NNSA that stewards the nuclear stockpile. We both have large high performance computing assets and as you might expect, uh, the NNSAs um, sit behind a secure enclave. And so their orientation to the allocation of those resources and the resilience and redundancy of those resources is fundamentally different than ours on the open science side where we open ours for open competition and the there's not a, uh, a mandate for us to preserve the data that each user, we have thousands of users every year. Uh, you know, not that we just go and delete their data willy-nilly, but 
that there's not a a mission objective bent on uh, the long term preservation of every scientist or every collaborations um, works within our systems. Now that might sound like we don't care about that. No, we care deeply about it. In the era of open science and the uh, multi year progress towards a, you know steward you know more coherent stewardship philosophy for the U.S. government around open data and fair, you know, findable, accessible, interoperable, uh, reusable. That really is one of the thesis statements behind our high performance data facility is that we, for the last decade, have known we do not have a team whose mission it is to approach the data life cycle with full intention. And so we have a whole host of examples of, for example, climate or systems data, where almost uh, not through the kindness of strangers, but like at NERSC, for example, at Berkeley, we have a large archival tape archive, 100 petabytes, where the Earth Systems community knows they have a friend and that we have copies of, of very important large-scale data preserved there. But it's just one copy. Yeah. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I want to give you a flavor then. Okay. Yeah, and a related question about... Um... Uh, data import, uh, you know, particularly for life sciences um, uh, projects, you know, what, what fraction of these um, users are basically have data that they're bringing to the facility to um, basically run on the clusters versus uh, wanting to access kind of existing data that you that you may have access to? Um, in other words, is each kind of project kind of bringing its own data or do you, or do you see users kind of continually, you know, building on top of existing data sets within the uh, within your clusters? It's a bit of all of the above. It's it's hard to generalize, but and I'll add another aspect of this, which is the generation of, of data in silico at our centers that then needs a a destination in relationship to a community or a research group's prior works. This is another set of patterns and uh, workflows, if you will, that is a motivation for our high performance data facility, where a, a lot of and Kirsten can speak more expertly than I can frankly, uh, on this, uh, there's there's a lot of need a lot across not just the life sciences, but across many domains. Uh, so we're privileged to see the whole sweep of the problem space from where we sit in terms of DOE science, because we have so many users and so many disciplines represented. Thanks. Okay, so you mentioned that uh, NARE projects, and I'm kind of curious, those are all across agency and this does, it does feel like there's a growing, well, it's my mind, a need for uh, more homes for data like you were just discussing. And uh, I guess I'm wondering where the data from those projects is going to wind up, if you know, like if there are plans for the stewardship of any data generated as part of those projects, did that get negotiated between the agencies or are the researchers kind of figuring it out? Yeah, and I didn't do justice to the scope of those projects. Each one is chosen pretty sophisticated uh, judgment about, okay, this is a, the NAIR is in a pilot phase, so it's not funded. This is a coalition of the willing. And each of the agencies involved in really those three projects, they're all different, ad, different admixtures of NSF, NIH, and DOE. We're only really tackling things that we know we could do in 18 to 24 months, building on existing efforts. And one thing I failed to describe about what the DOE piece there is that all three of those projects involve Oak Ridge National Lab, which owing to prior works with Veterans Affairs and National Cancer Institute over the past about five years, developed a, a fully matured uh, environment called Citadel is what they call it. It's not just a physical infrastructure. It's really a, does it's an, it's hard to explain this. Uh, it's like a, it's a design pattern framed with the legal agreements for enabling protected health information from the VA or NCI to come into the Oak Ridge data center over ESnet in a secure way that has met the, the legal test and policy test of leadership at the agencies. So before that work, the notion of bringing the SEER data set, uh, 
to Oak Ridge to be crunched on the massive supercomputer was there's it wasn't there's no way to do it. There's no a way that anyone at the at um, NCI would sign off on that. But what we have today, after years of work, is this mature policy frameworks connected with the cybersecurity authority, connected with the actual physical infrastructure of how you move the bits, get them in to the machine. So to your question, Kirsten, about the forward view of where does the data live, for the projects that we have, none of them really present a, an issue where they're going to create some huge new source of data that won't have a home. They're more about uh, bringing in a data set that we know we can handle crunch on it and spit an answer back. Uh, so by spitting an answer back, are it also being used for training and creating new models? Only really? one of those three, and it's a very modest, large language model context in which the project is focused on, if you're an institution that has subscriptions to copyrighted uh, research uh, information, journals, um, other bespoke information stores, and you want, and this is plain language, and you want to do some LLM training that would convolve that with a public, you know, an LLM in the public domain, exploring that dynamic. The other projects, one is about, they're actually, the other two projects are more about synthetic data generation and testing the process by which you can ensure privacy enhancing technologies have actually done what you expect them to. So one project has uh, this aspect where create the synthetic data based on the real data and behind the, the, the high walls of the cybersecurity enclave, you'll have a separate team critically evaluate whether the privacy enhancing technologies did their did what we expect them to do and probing for it is is the synthetic data truly synthetic mm -hmm. um okay any other questions from the committee and if not i think we will um thank them and then I think it really that closes our, our open session. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ben, for uh, that uh, very helpful um, and uh, uh, appreciate the contribution. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Let me know if you need anything further. Happy to help. Bye. Take care. Bye. Good luck with your work.